Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we are going to get to work. I am talking about research and development R&D work, the work before the work even begins. What is R&D and why should an entrepreneur care about it? First, what is R&D? Well, it is self-explanatory, I must admit. According to Investopedia, R&D include activities that companies undertake to innovate and introduce new products and services. It is often the first stage in the development process. The goal is typically to add new products and services to market and to add to the company's bottom line. A great example of this is Nike. In fact, shout out to my boy Tate who is helping Nike innovate as we speak by asking athletes to test Nike shoes. That's right, Nike has shoe testers that will test the Nike shoe before it is even put into production. Typically, an organization is not expecting an immediate profit from R&D. These tend to be the concepts that are, at times, futuristic. Does anyone remember watching iRobot with Will Smith and he's driving that Audi RSQ concept car that is now in production today known as the Audi R8? iRobot was released in 2004, but the Audi R8 wasn't released until 2006. Man, do I feel old. But that is the concept of R&D. Companies use R&D to stay ahead of the game, if you will. Take the Sony Walkman, for example. Talk about innovation. How badass did everyone look in the 80s with their neon everything, volume hair, fanning packs with the Walkman attached to it, jamming out to some Michael Jackson riding roller skates? Don't laugh, folks. That was the look. Although Sony's Walkman is pretty much an antique, Sony is still around. Why? Because of their R&D department. From audio to visual, Sony keeps ahead of the curve by supporting R&D. However, Sony is a huge company. What about an entrepreneur? It is important to estimate the risk adjustment return on R&D expenditures or risk capital because R&D sometimes takes years to pay off. The more an entrepreneur invests in R&D, the higher level of capital risk. An example given, potential of loss of part or all of an investment. Some companies spend billions in R&D. Amazon, Volkswagen, Samsung, to name a few, even those billion-dollar companies must calculate their capital risk for R&D because, again, R&D will allow an entrepreneur to stay ahead of the curve. So get out there, do some research and development, but make sure you calculate your risk. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Fallon and Dave Dumbro. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Dave, did I, did I, did I get it? Yeah, you did great. Oh man. See, we were, <laughs> we were actually talking earlier about making sure we get the names right. Cause that's one of my big things. So first and foremost, thank you guys so much for being on the show this morning. Uh, I really very interested about your guys's um, product, which is a shoe, uh, but a very unique shoe. So first though, I would love to introduce the world to Dave and Kevin. So Dave, I'm going to go with you first. All right. Just introduce the world to Dave. Who who is Dave? Dave. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone. Uh, my name is Dave Dombro. I have uh, you know been in the shoe shoe game here for wow. I guess Kevin's been over twenty years, um, mm-hmm. and much of that journey has has been with my uh, business partner here, Kevin Fallon. But um, you know, from N- Nike, early Nike days to 
Puma days to Under Armour days uh, to now to Speedland, where uh, Kevin and I are, you know, uh, starting this new uh, new brand. Why shoes? You know, always had a passion for shoes. Actually, I grew up, uh, you know, basketball fanatic. I think basketball shoes were the nice. the the gateway there. But uh, <laughs> always, always uh, was into shoes, running shoes, basketball shoes, and. Um, you know, was fortunate to go to design school and kind of tailored that to start designing shoes. And uh, that wound, um, eventually wound up where I ended up at Nike doing basketball shoes. So that was kind of my first, first gig out of college. Nice. And you've, you guys worked with, you've worked with like quite a, quite a bit of people at Nike, correct? Worked with quite a bit. As, I mean, you're talking about like athletes? Yeah, and, athletes. And, yeah, I worked with quite a bit of athletes, uh, pretty much it at all the companies that we've, we've been with, um, probably the most at Under Armour actually, but, um, yeah, at Nike, Puma, uh, Under Armour, we, we have always had that interaction and that's a, um, you know, pretty, feel pretty lucky to have that. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, Kevin, let's, let's introduce the world to Kevin Fallon. All right. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Well, my journey into footwear was a little bit more, uh, accidental maybe than Dave's. I, I wasn't, uh, uh, necessarily a shoe fan, uh, growing up, but I loved, airplanes and cars and boats and things that went fast and and I I thought well I want to do that when I go to college so I got into the best engineering school I could and uh, got a mechanical engineering degree but I was introduced to uh, design as a profession or as a even a school option when I was uh, at Brown the Rhode Island School of Design is on the same campus so I, I really had my eyes open to that whole world and I thought, well, I, that feels a lot better than engineering to me. And so I went to um, Art Center after Brown. And, um, I had a good friend and roommate who did internships, multiple internships at Nike, and just spoke so highly of it. He loved it and uh, encouraged me after graduation to come up and interview. I was still kind of thinking I was going to get into transportation design somehow. Um, but it was hard not to be blown away with the Nike campus, and I met so many great people. And, I, you know, I did love shoes in terms of solving problems and, and that. And what I didn't know at the time was how much it would really, um, how much I would come to love doing shoes. I mean, there's so much more in shoes than people realize. Yeah. It's a great combination of engineering and design. So it just worked out to be a great fit. And, you know, that was 97 when I started the industry. So 24 years later, here we are starting yeah. our own thing. And uh, Dave and I found a partnership along the way. That worked really well at Puma. He was in Boston. I was in uh, Germany. We were managing the design teams together, and then we in- intentionally moved to Under Armour together and had the opportunity to take that from a very small footwear company. They were probably around $100 million at the time. Yeah. And when we left, it's, it was over a billion dollars. Um, so, you know, that was just a fascinating journey on its own. But like most journeys, it, it came to an end, and it was time for us to do something else. And we just kind of looked at each other and said, hey, this works between he and I. Yeah. Let's figure out a way to you know, do something different. You know, one of the things you mentioned, you went, we went to engineering school. Mm-hmm. And then you were talking about the designing of the shoes and how there is some um, similarities between engineering. And how, how was your schooling? And does, did your schooling for engineering actually help with your designing of shoes? You know, I, it, it would be easy to say no, because you don't, I didn't need anything from my engineering degree to get into footwear design. Right, right. But I think in my journey, it was very important. I mm. think it, it skewed me a little as a designer toward the technical side. Gotcha. It allowed me to cross over a little bit into development. It's playing a, you know, maybe a, a larger role now, you know, just in a division between two people. Um, but you know, the, the critical thinking, the problem solving was something that, you know, I think spills over into any design. I mean, engineering and design are so interrelated, at least in my mind, yeah. that um, it's hard for me to separate the two. And, you know, that might be my weakness as a designer is not being able to kind of let go of some of the tangible real <laughs> things. But, um, you know, that that's why, you know, a partnership like working with Dave can work because yeah. he's, you know, maybe not tied to that engineering in the same way. And, and so from that aspect, we, we complement each other. We overlap in certain areas, but not in others. Definitely. So let's, and the reason I asked about the engineering is because the shoe, the shoe land, the company that you guys created, it, to me, I look like this is like a very unique engineering feat of a shoe, right? But first for the listeners at home, 
What is Speedland? Well, in a very macro sense, Speedland is started with no compromises in mind. So when Kevin and I t- sat down a while back and we really thought about it, we're like, what if you could create a new brand, new shoe company? We use a, the word equipment, actually, but and you didn't have to compromise anything. So you could use the best materials, mm-hmm. the best components, the best suppliers. Um, what would that generate? And in our case, we focused it in the world of trail uh, running. But it's really more of a macro approach um, because really that's not the approach that we have experienced throughout our years. And it's not to say that brands aren't making you know phenomenal shoes. They are. But it's very rare to see a no compromise approach really taken in any industry um, because there's a lot of uh, restrictions, let's say. Uh, and in our case, um, you know, with, with footwear, you get things like briefs and you, the, on, on the briefs you have an FOB, um, which is the, you know, the cost uh, that you need to, to hit to make the product. And we just didn't have those restrictions. We took a complete almost opposite approach to the industry um, and that's, you know, I guess I would say this, the start of Speedland. Yeah, I think that no compromise approach. We're focused on mountain running and trail um, because that's our passion. If we're going to spend a lot of time with these athletes and, yeah. and out there, this is something that matters to us. And we also saw it as an underserved market. You know, these athletes are doing incredible things in the mountains. And if anybody deserves an elevated experience in their footwear, these people and we thought you know that's a great combination for us and and so speedland is you know mm-hmm. focused on the mountains hyper performance and you know about this no compromise and that's what we're yeah and so you you mentioned two things one you, you guys kind of have a passion for for mountain climbing and running and that's that's so for the folks at home that may not be aware these shoes are specifically designed for extreme mountain runners correct is, is, or something like is that is that safe to say i i yeah, I would say they're designed. Yes, that's our target is a high performance trail athlete. Yes, I would just say on, in terms of extreme, not necessarily <laughs> like extreme mountains, but you have to be right, extreme yeah. in the sense of caring so much about your footwear and about your experience running in the mountains mm-hmm. to, to spend the money that it would require because right. these are expensive, but also to care about the technologies that are in. Yeah. So extreme in that way, I would say if you run 10 K's on trails, this might still be a great shoe for you. Yeah. You just said, you know, you're not probably a super casual trail runner. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the design because I think you guys specifically set out to solve a specific problem with this shoe. What problem did you guys kind of set out to solve and why did you guys add some of the technology to the shoe? it's many problems i would say (laughs) i mean that's the most interesting thing and we break it down into different pieces and then we attack each piece with with a solution and then it was you know sort of the process of integrating those solutions and it was pulling from our knowledge at you know that we've acquired over the years and and the the suppliers so i mean it was for instance looking at fit it's a very important thing and we're strong believers that if things fit better you Mm -hmm. perform better less wasted energy going into that shoe and, and so on. So fits an important one. Cushioning, you've got to have a certain amount of cushioning. If this is going to be a shoe, someone can run a 50K, 100K, 100 miles in certain requirements. And there's become propulsion has become a, a common area, right? So what can we do with plates? And how can we look at carbon plates, not from the perspective of what the road shoes are doing, but from how can this technology make the trail experience better? And so it's this aggregation of marginal gains on, on every aspect. Traction is another key one. Yeah. We went to Michelin. I mean, one of the best rubber suppliers yeah. on the globe. And they're doing footwear. And we were able to pull a couple adjacent technologies from their mountain biking tires with these cuttable lugs. It allows us to us and the consumers to trim their uh, lugs to a length that's ideal for them. And that's new. And the thin web sidewall allows us to stitch sole to the upper we're thinking about end of life in some of these decisions so mm. you know we're, we're solving problems from the athlete side but certainly on the uh on the um you know the whole life cycle side as yeah. well because that's a big big part of what we want to do as well and i guess i would say we saw a lot a lot of r&d being put into the road side of running mm-hmm. but we didn't see a lot of r&d being put into the 
outdoor trail side of running. Mm. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but that also, you know, was white space for us to go into that area. Yeah, it definitely, you mentioned earlier, kind of seems like a, a, an untapped market, right? A market with the running market, I feel like the street running, it's pretty saturated. There's a lot of running shoes out there. It's pretty saturated and there's a lot of good running shoes out yeah. there. And there's a lot of good trail shoes out there too, but it's just not necessarily the same attention. Um, and so we, we saw an opportunity. What would you guys say during the design of the shoe was the most surprising thing that you guys needed to kind of address or did you maybe this is something that you knew throughout your guys's career in the footwear industry but what was something that you really felt that we need to make sure that this is addressed in the shoe Hmm. that's a tough one (laughs) yeah i think that that again comes back to kind of this aggregation of of things because there's there are good shoes out there there's some shoes with great traction Mm. and you know those were things that we were trying to learn from and be inspired by why is the traction great how can we use that so the thing is that that shoe with the great traction might have really lousy cushioning oh, yeah. or an upper that doesn't fit well or last long or something. And so that that's kind of, I think, what became core to what we wanted to do yeah. was, was, you know, have it be this sum of the best of all these components to make an experience that was completely elevated and, and better. Nice. So you guys were at Nike, went to Under Armour, Decided to create Speedland. Puma in between. Oh, Puma in between, yes. Yep, yep. So now you're, you're created Speedland. Did you guys, how did you guys create it? Did you guys go LLC route, S Corp, C Corp? We LLC. 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 And now or did you guys do grassroots funding? Do you guys have to do venture capital? We are self-funding. Yep. Nice. That was important to us, actually. And that's not to say we want to do that forever. This is a tough thing to scale without eventually getting some support. But mm-hmm. we've just felt we wanted to make the brand first. We wanted to get out there, make sure that our principles were clear, that people knew what we stood for, that the product was doing what we said it could do. And I think that's just around the belief that we, you know, we want to do it our way. Yeah. And and that sounds maybe (laughs) kind of control freakish, but you know, if you're going to start your own thing, you want to be able to make the decisions that are how you see it and how you believe it, not based on the pressures of investors or people yeah. trying to grow at an artificial rate. And we're in a niche of a niche. Yeah. 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 And we are under no illusion. This is not like a fast money grab, <laughs> you know, we would have been better off staying in corporate jobs Yeah, in that respect, <laughs> you know, totally. but we wanted to do something, one that we cared about and two, you know, that was the right way to do it. And it's going to take some time. Yeah. You know, it's going to take, you know, our whole mission is authentication and talking to the athletes and, you know, it's one by one conversations. Sometimes they come to us, sometimes we go to them, but when we talk footwear, it's important. It's important to them. It's important that we all share some values. And so that's going to take a little time to grow, but we yep. think that's the right way to do it. It's not blasting it everywhere and trying to push it into doors. Yep. You know, it's about coming to our website, understanding our mission, phone us up, email us. I yeah. mean, we, we respond to a lot of that stuff through social directly because we, we can, you know, it's just the two of us. And we want to have that relationship with, with these consumers. We want them to know want these athletes to know that we're you know supporting these amazing things that yeah they're doing you know it's funny you say that because one of the things I've, I've actually mentioned this to you I've, I've been noticing your guys's launch you know for this product and it's been very intimate um working directly with the consumers it's not like advertising you're not launching in an advertising world where you're like super marketing you're actually with this every time i see you're marketing this material you're with the people you know you have the product in hand and you're yeah. talking with them you're it's not like you put you know, just like a, a photo and you put it out there. You're really in there making sure that your your consumers are enjoying the product. And that has been really fun to watch uh, because I think what I would say, you know, one question I have, corporate America, right? Now your guys are entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what is what is the biggest difference and maybe some of the difficulties mm-hmm. that you guys are seeing? Well, I mean, I, I think you just hit something though that's in, Kevin and I from the start it was super important is authenticity. Mm, yeah. Right. And I think that can be a big difference between I would say what we're trying to do and corporate America. Mm. Because we actually are, you know, going to the events, you know, our athletes are central to what we're doing. They're they're a huge part. And pretty much everything we're doing uh, is kind of in some ways different than what's being done on a larger corporate scale at some of the other brands. And that's on purpose. Um, and make no mistake about it, like, when you're doing stuff that's different, 
you have a lot of doubters as well. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, from, hey, our, our shoe is $375. That's the most expensive trail shoe that's ever been created. Running shoe. Running shoe, but trail shoe as well. Yes, <laughs> that's yes, ever yes. been no. created on the market ever. So, you know, just right there, you know, obviously we're doing something different. We're doing it for a reason, but we're trying to really um, go to the events not be authentic to be authentic, be authentic because we are authentic and we actually care about our athletes. Yeah. They're central to who we are yep. and show that in our social and show what we're actually doing. Um, and that's how we're building organically building a company. Um, it's a very different approach. And like Kevin said, it's not the, it might not be the VC approach of like, yeah. um, you know, churn and burn here, but, but that is our approach and um, you know, we're committed to it. Yeah. I like it. I've, again, I've, I really enjoy watching your guys' launch because it's so intimate, right? You're very much a part of that. What would you say has, uh, you know, what would you guys say has been some of the difficulties of starting this business? Well, uh, you know, I guess for us being, having been in corporate America, one of the things that happens is you get siloed one way or another. Yeah, you you totally. get to be an, an expert in a certain area and you go really deep in that area and, you know, you might have some crossover on either side of your jobs or you see some stuff above and below and you pick up things. But when you comes to entrepreneurship, all of a sudden it's all on you. All yeah. of from taping the boxes together and doing shipping to figuring out the websites. And, you know, so that is a, a big difference where you've got teams surrounding you to help you with a lot of the adjacent pieces in a corporate job when it comes to the entrepreneurship you've really got to be prepared and, and know what it means at the very least to be taking on all of that um, and I think you know doing it as a pair is a lot easier than probably trying to shoulder it all as, as one person yeah I think so yeah I mean I think we got some advice like that that you know but keep it small but doing it alone is hard I don't know if I would say was this is like a difficulty, but I would say, you know, you have to be very persistent. Like you have to be a persistent personality um, if you want to start something. Um, that's what we're finding. I mean, there's like I said, there there's there's doubters, there's there's different things that come in that will you know dissuade you from from moving forward, and you just have to have that attitude and that mindset. Like no, moving forward, persistence. This is we're going to overcome this challenge, and like Kevin said two of us, we can go back and forth about those discussions. M would be much more difficult if it was just one person. Definitely. You'd internalize it a lot more. Yeah. Now, is this your guys' first business? Yeah. Yes. It, have you guys ever, like, previously, like, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to own my own business, or this was really just kind of fell into it? Uh, you know, I speak for myself first. I, I guess I would say I grew up with um, a family that was basically an entrepreneur their whole life. Uh, so, you know, not somebody that was ever in corporate, corporate side, starting different businesses in different fields. Mm -hmm. And so I was always around that growing up. So I think in the back of my mind, I knew that my path would eventually lead to the, to some form of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was quite happy in corporate America as well. And I learned a lot in corporate, you know, so I, I can't, um, say I didn't enjoy that side as well, but, um, I'm not surprised that I eventually wound up here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Similarly for me, my dad started a company when I was 10 years old. And so I was getting a front row seat for, I guess, entrepreneurial thinking and, and acting and behaviors. Um, and, you know, as I have a son around the same age, I think serendipitously it just became the right thing to do. And I, I think that's kind of the, one of those gifts that you can give your kids that they don't realize and you might not fully realize the value either, but for them to be able to see that and what it takes and the work and the why and all those important things. And um, also, you know, you don't get a chance to have your family come into the business if you don't have a business. So, you know, there's always that chance as well. So yeah. I think we were looking at it in multiple ways. So, you know, you guys started your business and you guys are kind of new in the entrepreneurship world. What advice would you have for like a younger entrepreneur or maybe individuals who want to create a product because you guys are in the design, you know, product design um, service area. What advice would you have for them? Kind of 
watch out for this or don't mm. do this. Well, my first advice would be make sure you're really passionate about what you're mm. doing. That's really a great passionate yep. about that product. Um, because a lot of people, sometimes I just see, you know, in the periphery is like, yeah, I'm going to start this just because, you know, this will be a good opportunity for me to start. Yeah. Do you actually care about the product? Yeah. Because that actually is going to matter at some point. Um, like when it goes back to that persistent thing and you're staying up late nights and you're having to fight through challenges. Um, you know, we really care about the product that we're creating. Um, and that matters a lot. So that would be my first thing. I don't know, Kevin. Yeah. And I would say, you know, with, with that comes, uh, knowing the user, you know, who, who's the, who's the person who needs this, whose life is going to be better or who we're trying to get to interact with this product, because that's another piece that you're going to spend a lot of time with those people. If you're doing it right, if you're doing it correctly and you know, you, you're going to want to, you better want to hang out with them. <laughs> yeah. <you know>? So <laughs> I think that's, it's just important too. I, I would say, um, thinking end to end, you know, if you really, if, if you know one piece of this and you're an expert in that, that that's great. But you, you know, you really have to know what it takes to get something from end to end. And if you know where your weaknesses are, then you know where you got to bring in help and it makes it a lot easier rather than trying to think, well, I got to do this all myself. And, you know, that would be one of the pieces of advice too, is, you know, don't be afraid to bring in the best people you can to help you on the things that you can't do yourself. Yeah, you know, there's a few things you you're, uh, you two have been mentioning throughout this uh, episode that I think are important for the listeners because we've been hearing it pretty consistently over the last couple of times I've been interviewing entrepreneurs is, one, you have to have a passion for what you do. Like, if you don't have a passion, it's, it's very difficult and it will just, it'll eat you up, right? You're going to get burnt out pretty quickly. Two, it's okay to talk about your product. And don't keep it a secret. I think a lot of times the younger entrepreneurs will hold in their ideas and not give it out and not tell anybody. In fact, I had um, Rick uh, from Pi on earlier this week, and he was talking about that as well. It's like, get your ideas out there. See if the consumer even likes it, right? Because too often we tend to fall on the sword of this is like you were mentioning earlier, Dave, you know, sometimes we get into these, we get into products and start selling, but we don't really have a passion for it. But we, we think it's a money, because it's a money grab, right? It's an opportunity to make a revenue. And that will kind of burn sometimes, right? And so for the listeners at home, those those are really important things to kind of think about, you know. And then lastly, it's difficult, you know. Being an entrepreneur is hard because being a founder in particular, there's there's very long lonely nights because you're doing it by yourself, and you two have each other. A lot of times, I've had individuals come on by themselves, solo solo founders who are really like, it's just me. I have nobody else to kind of relate to, right? Nobody can relate to the stress I'm going through. How has how how has the partnership of co-founder, how do you feel it has benefited uh, a Speedland in their growth? Like you two coming together. Well, I, I think there's many answers to that. I mean, the one Dave mentioned earlier is we can bounce these panic moments off each other and yeah. hey, I'm freaking out about this or is this like, do you see it the same way? And, you know, just kind of keep it an even keel for each other is, is critical. I think also just the division of the work, um, for us, it's happened pretty organically and it wasn't ever like, okay, here's your assignment, here's mine, or here's a hard line. It's just, there's a lot of stuff that's got to get done and you have to have that ability to kind of make sure you're sharing it and checking yeah. it off at the same time, yeah. you know, so. We're fortunate that we've worked together for, tw- you know, in the yeah, corporate time. side for t- over 20 years. So, you know, we kind of already had maybe a, a relationship back and forth as far as yeah. work goes. So, um, you know, we were able to translate a lot of that into entrepreneurship, which is great. Yeah, that, that's that's a great story. And now, looking back on everything, you know, Dave, I'll start with you. Looking back, you know, younger self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, you know, I I, I have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> I, I do think there is a, a an advantage to having some night being a bit naive and starting something you know really when you're young and giving it a go i do think there is an advantage to that that being said i don't want to paint a false picture that it would be easy um i think there would be a lot of luck involved so i think in in my head i still would probably go the route that i went and really gain that experience on the corporate side Mm -hmm. um, with the different brands and you know in a better place now to start a business but um I, I would at times possibly give advice to my younger self that maybe take maybe take that risk um, right out of school and mm. if the idea was really strong yeah. and give it a go um, before 
all the other life happens yeah. around you. Yeah. So, so I, I, I would, uh, I would give that advice, but knowing that a lot of luck and, um, a lot of things have to fall in place. Um, that would be my, my advice. What, what do you think? Ken? Well, for my younger <laughs> self, I think I would, I would try to take the blinders off a little bit. I think I was so myopic and so focused on becoming like a great designer. Mm. I missed opportunities to plug into other oh, okay. parts of the business. I probably missed chances to collaborate. You know, I was like too competitive. It was like a thing where, oh yeah, okay, I don't want to really talk to you because I yep. got this design going on. <laughs> I'm not here. selling the farm. <laughs> kind of like that, you know. And and Art Center was a tough environment that way. And I think. For at the time, or it was just me, whatever, I came out of there with that kind of competitiveness that was good. It fueled a lot of things that were maybe positive, but there were some negatives. And I'd say, as an entrepreneur, man, if you got to be one thing, you got to be a collaborator. You know, you yeah. can't do it all yourself. Yes. You got to be able to work with people and get people to want to work with you. Yes. And I think that's a skill I could have started earlier in my career than I did. <laughs> I was a late starter on that one. So I'm a big fan now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But early in my career, I probably wasn't. I would say I was, you know, more closed yeah. off. You know, it's kind of funny you talk about competitiveness. In fact, later this afternoon, I'm, I'm doing a fantasy draft for football. And okay. one of my buddies is like, hey, let's do a mock draft together. And I was like, no, you're in my league. I don't want to do a mock. <laughs> you're going to know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like right. the competitiveness. So for the listeners at home, who is who is the target audience? Who's the consumer? And how can they get, a, uh, get the product? Well, I mean, like I said, we position it more as like trail equipment. Mm -hmm. So it's someone who really is, um, some as we call it the gearhead, you know, someone who <laughs> has, you know, they might have a, a really, you know, might have that mountain bike uh, in their garage. They might, might have some other pieces of gear as well, skis and different things. And it's really geared after, it's, it's going after somebody who's, you know, a trail runner at heart, um, but it could be any distance, you know, you could, could be a long distance trail runner, it could be a short distance, but you really have that equipment mindset. You really like gear. Yeah. Um, and you really want the latest technologies um, and want to have a new experience on the trail. That's the whole thing that this SLPDX is delivering. Nice. And then where, where can they find it? We're, we're direct to consumer, so you can find it at runspeedland.com. Perfect. And our uh, social is at runspeedland. Nice. Kevin, Dave, thank you both so much for being on the show today. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.